Welcome to Food Psych, a podcast about intuitive eating, body positivity, and health at every size. I'm your host, Christy Harrison, and I'm a registered dietitian, nutritionist, and certified intuitive eating counselor specializing in weight-inclusive wellness. Join me as I talk with interesting people from all walks of life about their relationships with food. Hey there, welcome to episode 93 of Food Psych. I'm your host, Christy Harrison, and today we have a very special episode for you in honor of National Nutrition Month and the beginning of National Eating Disorders Awareness Week. I got together with two of my favorite colleagues in the health at every size and eating disorder recovery field, Julie Duffy Dillon and Rebecca Scritchfield, to talk about some of the issues with uh, National Nutrition Month and the messaging you might be getting this month and why we need to change the game when it comes to how we talk about nutrition and health. That's all coming up in a minute, and I can't wait to share it with you all. First, though, I want to tell you about a couple of great resources for helping you make peace with food. The first is my free quiz to assess if you have a healthy relationship with food, kind of see where you're at, and I'll send you your results via email along with more than a dozen individualized tips to help you make peace with food wherever you may fall on the spectrum right now. You can take the quiz and get your results today at christyharrison.com slash quiz. That's christyharrison.com slash quiz. The second resource I want to share is my intuitive eating online course. It's a 13-week program that I created to help you work through all the principles of intuitive eating in depth and really demystify and troubleshoot some of the common areas where people tend to get stuck with intuitive eating. So I'll show you how to recognize the diet mentality even in its subtle forms and how to start substituting healthy thoughts instead. I'll share my secrets to making food and exercise choices from a place of self-care rather than a place of self-control. I'll teach you how to navigate emotional eating and how to stop alternating between restricting and overeating and how to do all of this from a health at every size, body positive, weight neutral perspective. So the course really is designed to help you make peace with not only food, but also your body. Learn to accept your body and trust its wisdom to guide you whatever size you may be, just help you give up the pursuit of weight loss in favor of having a really good relationship with food. And check out what a few of the participants have had to say about this course. I'm so grateful for both the Intuitive Eating Fundamentals course as well as the Food Psych podcast. The course helped give me a community to stay on track towards a shared goal, which is so, so important. This course was extremely well-designed and well-written. I love the infographics as well as the links to pertinent Food Psych episodes. I also reinforce things that I'm already working on in therapy and in life more broadly. I wouldn't change a thing about the course. That's from participant with initials MM. And then participant JS says, this course has been so helpful. I've learned so much about how the diet mentality and the food police in my head have led me to restrict foods. I've learned about self-compassion and treating myself kindly. And the resources have been so valuable. The Q&A podcasts in which participants can ask questions and get answers from Christy are incredibly helpful. I no longer feel alone in this journey towards peace with food. So if you'd like to join other people on this intuitive eating journey, go to christyharrison.com slash course to learn more and sign up. That's christyharrison.com slash course. Finally, if you like the podcast and you want to help us reach more people who need to hear the body positive message, you can leave us a great review on iTunes. Just open up iTunes on your computer or the podcast app on your phone, type in food psych to the search bar. Click on the result that comes up under podcasts and then go to the ratings and reviews tab and you can leave your nice rating and review there telling us what you love about the podcast. I'm always so grateful to get these nice reviews. It totally makes my day when I read them and they also help bring us up in the ratings so that more people can find these body positive messages. So the ratings and reviews you leave and if you share the podcast on iTunes with your family and friends, that really helps too. So if you've already left a rating and review, thank you so much. You've made my day before already. And now you can share the podcast with family and friends by clicking on the little three dots next to the podcast name in iTunes and then clicking share podcast. And that will really help us get the word out to more people who need to hear these messages. All right. Now, without any further ado, let's go talk to Rebecca Scritchfield and Julie Duffy Dillon. So Rebecca, why don't you explain a little bit about how you came up with the idea for Change the Game? 
Sure. Well, I have recently been playing around with the idea of, of metaphors and specifically the ideas like tug of war. And it just popped into my head, this idea of just like, wow, you know, dieting really is a game and it is a game that we, that we can't win. And, you know, sitting on that, just random ideas I get every now and again, I just literally saw and wrote on a piece of paper, hashtag change the game. And it reminded me of so many things, you know, when someone has a really unique take on a situation or a fresh idea, a new book, you know, we talk about things being game changing. And yeah, I just thought it had a ring to it. And I was like, you know, this is a way where we can... I feel like we, we as a culture, we have normalized dieting. And I thought we just start to accept that this stuff is normal. Like, of course, we spend all of our time working on our parents. Of course, we try this or that. And, oh, but this is clean eating. So it's so good, you know, which we know are diets in disguise. And I was like, no, no, this is not the right frame for us. The right frame is dieting is a game. And I think when people do realize that and when they see the science and they, or, you know, I'm in the science, they know from experience <laughs> that it's like, okay, I can see that now, but what do I do? And so I just think it's the idea of you can change the game by refusing to play has legs. And I'm just so excited that you guys are interested and in joining in a collaboration to just help people take action in their own way in breaking up from dieting and refusing to play. Yes. I love it. (laughs) And I love the idea of things being a game changer, right? Because I feel like a lot of people who read Health at Every Size or Intuitive Eating or introduced to these concepts really feel that way. It's like that that's a game changer. That's going to change my life. You know, nothing's ever the same. So Mm -hmm. I think the idea of introducing an alternative to dieting is a real game changer for a lot of people. Yeah, I agree. And I feel like the thing that really intrigued me with it, Rebecca, is, you know, those of us who are eating disorder dietitians, we have been able to see the theme for so long now that like everyone develops an eating disorder for different reasons, but there's this theme of somehow diet, their diet changes and they experiment with changing it. And it leads to this really big monster. (laughs) And so it's been on our radar that this should not be normal. Why are we teaching people something that is considered to be so pathological or harmful to a group of people when we're also saying it's so bad for people who have anorexia and bulimia, you know, and like that, it's like a big sham in a sense. That's the thing I always think of. So when you brought up change the game, I'm like, oh yes, I need to be out on this (laughs) because we (laughs) need to change it. It cannot be normal anymore. This, because you're right. Disordered eating is now normal eating and this is not okay. Mm. Yeah, it's so toxic, right? It's like this thing that is really detrimental to people is being held forth as sort of a fun thing to do. And the game aspect of it too really jumps out at me when like, you know, we just finished up January and the sort of back to diet month that happens then, you know, where people are like comparing notes on, ooh, what are you trying? And how many miles did you run? And, you know, sharing tips or whatever in this way that is very normalized and seems very like fun and light, but actually is super toxic. Mm -hmm. Well, and it is a mind game too, right? I mean, so depriving yourself of energy and nutrients has a biological impact and it impacts your ability to focus and to concentrate and to be creative, (laughs) you know, things that we need in our life. And it doesn't take much of a restriction or a deficit to produce some of that. So it it literally messes with your mind biologically. But then also I think in the psychological sense of like, congratulations, you're doing something good, right? We have aligned dieting with health in our culture, you know, to where like, I mean, we know in nutrition school, if somebody had hypertension, well, you're going to give them the gram sodium diet. Hmm. And that literally meant clinically diet meant this is your eating plan and your way of life, not necessarily losing weight to look hot in that bikini or whatever. (laughs) But we know culturally that is what the word means. 
You know, it means that I'm somehow going to be a better person or some, you know, when I follow this, then life starts and then life begins. And it's just so frustrating is even with all the, like the, the sort of what we know as diets in disguise, like whole 30 and paleo and all that. We know that if you go from not thought out and unstructured and chaotic type of eating plans, and then go into something like that, that, yeah, you might feel better because you were putting more thought and plan into it. But what do you do on day 31 of whole 30, you know? So it, it really messes with our minds and we've, mm-hmm. we've got to help more people understand that situation. It is not health. You know? Oh yeah. I always think of a diet is the ultimate like seduction. You know, it promises that you're finally going to be accepted because your body's going to be more acceptable and you're going to finally find love and you're going to have all your shit together. <laughs> you know, it be, has so much meaning, but then it's like, it's really just a fantasy because it doesn't do any of that. Like, like you said, day 31 of whole 30, I know what people are doing. (laughs) They're they're not finally experiencing bliss. Well, maybe if they're finally like allowing themselves to eat something, but then they usually feel really crappy about it. Yeah. So I always think of dieting as this like sham because it's the seductive fantasy of the century. Mm, Absolutely. Yeah. I think it's, it's really interesting. The whole idea of like what happens after the diet, right? People are sold this idea that everything's going to be shiny and new and your life is just going to sort of resume. You'll be able to have pleasure in food again, but like with this whole new body and this whole new life. And that's just not the reality. Usually when people go on a diet, oftentimes, especially with the first diet, it's like there is a little bit of that. There's a little of the honeymoon phase, but it never lasts. And then they're chasing that dream of what the diet was supposed to be for months or years or decades to come. Well, you know, and that, that you bring up an interesting point, Christy, because I feel like why, why does the masses, like, why do they feel like it's their fault when diets don't work for them? Because I'm like, you know, the, the three of us, we're, we see how diets don't work. Like we see the shambles it leaves behind. And I just, it's so frustrating that I'm like, is there another way we can do it? And that's why I think change the game is a way to, to like really using metaphor to help for someone to really come to that place where like, oh, wait, it isn't my fault. Like diets suck. They never, they never were meant to work. You know, this was like the scam all the time. Yeah. Yeah. And when people can see how they've been manipulated and how this is part of a larger system, it's not their fault. And the system is designed to make you feel like you're at fault, right? Because that's how it functions. That's how it continues to function is people thinking they need to just do it harder, better, faster, or whatever. The next time that keeps them coming back for more. But if they can really see beyond it and see like, oh, all of this is engineered to keep us trapped. Like yeah. the matrix, you know, Aaron Flores said that on, <laughs> on his episode of Food mm-hmm. Psych. And I thought that was very apropos, you know, once you kind of see the matrix, you can't go back. You can't unsee it. No, you yeah. can't unsee it. Nope. <laughs> no. <laughs> well, and there's a really good quote. I want to say it was, now I'm going to draw a blank, but the bottom line is the worst type of a consumer is a confident consumer. You know, and so as like with dieting and beauty and, you know, all this stuff, it's like, if you are confident, you're not going to be as likely to need their stuff. So their, their mission is even if you feel great is to tell you, Hey, you don't feel good. (laughs) You know, you don't feel good and you don't look good because they need to make you want what they're selling. And that's how they keep you in the game. It's another mental thing. Let me put this ad, let me create this scenario that a person can relate to emotionally. Maybe you're feeling a hair of that, or maybe they just did a focus group and they targeted you. And what they're saying is exactly how you're feeling. That whole game is set up. The dieting industry, what 50 some billion a year, we need to keep these people giving their money to us by making them believe that they're a problem and they need fixing. So be aware of that. Be very critical of advertisements and articles, even if things look educational, trying to get clicks, you know, are they profiting off of your insecurity that you actually want to work on becoming more secure 
or are are they trying to make you feel more insecure than you really are? Because if you're, you know, if you're happy, be happy. Wait, I don't need that. They're trying to convince me I need that. That's a that's another example of dropping the rope and changing the game. Yeah. Yeah. Getting out of that tug of war, right? Like not picking up the side that they're expecting you to pick up. Mm-hmm. That's a really good metaphor. Yeah. yeah. I know. I'm picturing dropping the rope, watching them just like fall all down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They did that yes. in like, I'm showing my taste in movies, but like Revenge of the Nerds. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there was a tug of war yeah. and one of the sides, yeah. they dropped and everyone fell and got bruised and dirty. Like that would be a fun thing to do to dieting. I'm just going right. to let go of you. Well, you know, besides like preying on the insecurity, the other thing I noticed too, that is like the hot clickbait is like the fear mongering with food. Like we need to be fearful that it's going to kill us if we mm-hmm. have like one bite of a cookie because mm-hmm. it has sugar, in it, you know, or something like that. So I'm like, that's something that's really irritating and another reason to drop that rope. Like it's not that extreme. It's just mm-hmm. not that big of a choice in the moment. You know, it's not going to kill us by taking one bite of something. Yeah. I mean, I agree with you a hundred percent and, you know, it's reminding me of just our, our field of nutrition, of dietitians and, you know, in general, it's like, I feel like we often kind of wear this hat, right? I'm the nutritionist. So I'm supposed to tell them to get their vegetables and fruits and I'm supposed to tell them to, you know, cut back on sweets and this and that. And it's like, yes, I understand that general direction. But like when, when we do our best at behavior change, it's like individual tailored approaches where you really understand what's going on in an individual person's life. I don't think it's helpful to, to me, it looks like the food police. I think that we should be more bold and show our flexibility. We should know our information. Like we don't have to be dietitians that say, yes, everyone should eat tons of added sugar because we know they're probably not going to feel good that way. And we know they might miss out on, you know, nutrients or just other foods that they enjoy. But by encouraging flexibility of a variety of foods and encouraging more mindfulness with our choices, right. And more enjoyment of eating. I think we can do more in our field to talk less about individual nutrients or even the health halos around food and good and bad food like you're bringing up, we would do better service by talking more favorable about food in general and reducing that sort of guilt or shame. Like, yes, cookies even with real butter and sugar are fine. Let's not take that role of being the food police anymore. And it's not necessarily the most helpful thing to always be healthifying desserts for your clients. You know what I mean? My cookie has zucchini in it, so go for it. Oh, I can't even with that. (laughs) No, I don't care how good it tastes. I'm not going to eat it. Like, I think, because that's, it's it's all in principle, I know, but like, it just does it. it. it takes away the point of it because part of healthy eating includes pleasure. And so eating a cookie is pleasurable and that's something that I need and all of us need. We need to be able to experience that pleasure with food. And I think that's kind of scary for some folks and maybe some of our, our colleagues in the field of nutrition is like, Oh, if people have pleasure, then it's almost like this all or nothing thing. And we really, as a humans, we are really, we can, be trusted. <laughs> you know, like we're not going to just like eat one certain thing because as we find in our work, you know, the more people stay embodied and experience compassion and curiosity, their food intake ends up having more variety, which is like as dietitians, that's what we're always aiming for is variety is what healthy eating is. And so, yeah, the more we can stay connected, it's going to drive there eventually. So yeah, that's that brings up an interesting point, I think, about National Nutrition Month, because this is going to be coming out for the launch of National Nutrition Month. And the theme this year is put your best fork forward, which I just think is can go in so many different directions, right? Like, I mean, we could interpret that, I suppose, in a pro-intuitive eating way, but I think there's this subtle shoulding that's happening there, right? Like that needs to be unpacked. There's like a subtle diet message and subtle deprivation in that theme. And I think we're 
at a point in history when like diets don't want to say their diets and nobody wants to say they're depriving people. Everyone wants to say like, you can have bread, you know, or whatever. Mm-hmm. Right. And <laughs> make Oprah it a, said, so now we definitely so now can. now we can. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so if it, it's very nuanced, right? It's very tricky to understand why some nutrition messages are sort of wrapped up intrinsically with the diet mentality. Well, yeah, like we're involved in the game too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Ooh, yeah. No, not <laughs> us. <That's- laughs> not us personally, right? But but We've many really hard to get disconnected from that. Yeah. But mm-hmm. yeah, the the whole fork thing, I feel like it's really a shudder, you know, <laughs> like which is really close to that other word, right? Mm-hmm. But uh, yeah. <laughs> but, but we have fork and should that we could be playing with in this. <laughs> that's <laughs> true. Oh, my God. Yeah. yeah, but I feel like, you know, that's the thing that is part of the game. Like, oh, can I be eating something better, healthier, mm-hmm. you know, and that's what it's playing on. And that's the manipulation, the, the psychology that really can go down a rabbit hole instead of a place of health. Totally. We could say, eat whatever the fork you want. <laughs> Ooh, I like that. Yeah. Oh, that's oh, that, a great yeah. twist, actually. <laughs> yeah. Someone has to make a meme on that one. Yeah. Seriously, that's going on the um, list. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, look, I mean, even let's take the, okay, like we could scientifically open up our computers, look up the most recent NHANES data, right? This is like the the best picture we have of American eating habits, right? And dietary guidelines uses NHANES and stuff, right? So we could look at that. And we know that there is a discrepancy between the number of vegetables that's recommended for Americans and Americans' typical consumption, right? So that's the science part of it. But then to me, if we look at the theme, put your best fork forward and the art of it, I would look at my messages as like, how could I talk to people about Here's a simple way that you can kind of self-check if you're in the ballpark for for veggies, right? Because that is going to be based on individuals and their preferences and stuff. And, you know, usually people who are health conscious, it's like they've heard that get your veggies message, you know? And so that's what I'm thinking as a dietitian is like, how can I be helpful to get them to just kind of check in to see that they are getting enough? Because if they are, then great, just keep on enjoying your veggies. But I might guide to more adventure with them or more flexibility. Or if somebody is actually like, yeah, you know, I do think this is an area that I can improve. To me, your best fork forward is going to be more about, can I get them to use butter and salt because it tastes so good? Mm -hmm. You know, so my best fork might be about putting some freedom around how you can make them taste even better so that you enjoy them more so that then that boosts the data or easy ways of preparing, like what are real barriers to wearing that nutrition hat and boosting that nutrition that are much more about pleasure and flexibility and enjoyment and, and not that clinical grams of fiber and this and that, but more about a moment with friends and a moment with family, you know, I I got some parsnips in my hungry harvest box and I sauteed some last night and the girls didn't want to try it. And so Allison, my friend and fellow dietitian who works with me, she said, maybe try cutting them into like fry shapes and doing something like that and, and see if they'll try it. I just thought it was a cute idea. You know, it's like, I'm going to use up those vegetables and I'm interested in my kids trying them, but I'm more thinking about, well, what are ways that I can help with taste and dips that grow enjoyment? And I think we need more messages along that kind of stuff. Don't you, I mean, what do you guys Mm -hmm. think? Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I definitely agree. I feel like increasing the accessibility of it is a big part of it. And then also, you know, by promoting variety, we don't have to vilify another group of food, Mm. which I feel like that's what ends up happening. And so, yeah, like you're saying, like by you saying, hey, have butter or cheese or salt on your veggies, that's not saying eat less vegetables. (laughs) It just means like, (laughs) it's okay if they taste good, you know? And yeah, so I I totally agree. And instead of like, let's find a way to hide things into the cookie, like the zucchini we were talking about earlier. Um, (laughs) Let's just have it around. And, you know, all those that in in Haynes data, you know, I always think Mm -hmm. about like, what about people who don't have enough money? Like they don't have food security. So Mm -hmm. of course they're not going to go and buy zucchini. Like, because they're hungry. So yeah, zucchini. 
Yeah, it's not going to fill you up. And no. if you don't know if you're going to get a, more money tomorrow for food, you're going to pick something else. So that's the other part too. Like what about even just food security in general? So then people will have that kind of foundation of consistent access to food, which then also increases the variety that they're consuming. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that also is associated with better health, right? When people Mm -hmm. have more consistent access to food and less uncertainty in their life, less economic inequality, less social Mm -hmm. stigma. Like I think it's important in those correlational studies to look at the bigger picture. Because I think sometimes in Haynes makes us think like, oh, more vegetable consumption is associated with better health outcomes. They try to control for socioeconomic status, but I feel like that's just... It's one of those things you can't ever fully control all the factors, right? Like, you know, are Mm -hmm. they controlling for weight stigma? Are they controlling for diet history? Are they controlling for race and gender oppression and all this stuff, right, that contributes to people's health outcomes? So it's like all of it, right? We need to address all of it, the social injustice and the access issues. And then also the individual choices of like making it delicious, making it easy. And on that front, I always when I'm telling people about nutrition, I always bring up the point that pretty much all around the world, like if you look at meals from any cuisine you can think of, it basically all, they basically all have the same sort of building blocks, right? They usually include some sort of vegetable, but also some protein, some carbohydrates, some fat, some spices, you know, or herbs, right? And it's like, kind of mix and match with those components, like wherever you go. So you don't necessarily have to like, make a big deal about it or be like just putting some steamed broccoli on the side because you think you should have a vegetable. Like why not just make pasta with tomato sauce or pad thai with some peppers and onions or, you know, things that are interesting and maybe depending on your tastes and your cultural background, like fit within your culinary tradition or culinary tradition you want to try. But it doesn't have to be this huge extra effort. You know, you don't have to sneak veggies in usually. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, and you gave me this idea of then it kind of becomes so you're okay. I'm not dieting, but I'm following general guidelines for, you know, nutritious eating and everything that. But then that can often First of all, it can feel like a lot of today's diets, which I think is very confusing for people, you know, because in your mind, you're committed to not dieting, right? But then it could look like a whole 30 meal or a paleo (laughs) meal. And, and so I just want to acknowledge that I think it's for me, I don't know, I guess it was easier to like stop buying snack wells, you know, stop buying slim fat, you know, like there were clear diet foods that when I was doing my breakups that I think it is actually harder, harder now, but this is the thing that I don't think nutrition professionals say enough, you know, like you're in that mindset. It's like, you also might have a meal or even a day or several days where it's like, you just, you just don't want vegetables. And (laughs) I think that people are afraid they're going to lose the I love health card or something Mm -hmm. by like, they're going to take our license away. Yeah, (laughs) Our license or even like people who are our clients. Right. Uh And it's like, they want to identify as this non-dieting eater, but it's still a value that they care about their health and well-being. And we need to remove it from individual foods and individual meals. Like, we promise we're not going to take away that I care about my health and wellness card if you have a whole day of no vegetables, right? <laughs> like You still like them. You still care. Maybe just the produce wasn't right or you're sick or who knows what. Like every meal, the question doesn't have to be, where's my produce every meal that is diet minded to me. But I don't think that people hear that enough when it feels good to you and you're making your choices. Great. I don't know. I would say sometimes I make a mindful nudge, like, Oh, afternoon snack. And what am I thinking about? You know, and Oh, we'll do some carrots and hummus and some you know handful of chips or something, you know, like, so I'm not talking about that. I'm talking more about like, ooh, if I don't get these veggies, that must mean that I don't care about something about Mm -hmm. myself. Mm -hmm. Or I'm automatically unhealthy. Ah, You're one bite away from death. Yeah. Yeah. Right. (laughs) That is the message of this, this orthorexia style, you know, nutrition advice that floats around there now, right? It's like- Oh, I feel like they're infiltrating. Yeah. yeah. Don't you dare soda. Don't you dare, you know, actually, no. I mean, if 
truthfully, when you look at the mathematics of it, right, if we're being evidence-based and you look at the dietary guidelines, people can still hit nutrition targets and there's still room for flexibility. And if that is a soda, because that's your thing, why should you feel more guilty about choosing a soda because it wasn't a cookie or a brownie or something else, you know? So even like judging, you know, so A, you can still hit nutrition targets that are important, right? That we have the science for and still be flexible. That is clear in the science. And we need to be saying that more, but then also not judging where that flexibility is coming from. I see that being problematic. Like, well, maybe I should suggest this type of, you know, I mean, I'm probably even guilty of it, right? That's strawberry dipped in chocolate. Got that, you know, got just more <laughs> acid, 10 milligrams of vitamin C, you know, but like, I do think that is part of it, right? In putting your best fork forward, that flexibility is important. And I think an individual's autonomy over how they want to be flexible, truly without judgment, that's what dietitians should be encouraging. Yeah. Well, so we don't really know what the best fork really is. And there's no best anyway. Like, (laughs) there's no, like, there's no such thing there's no judgment really that exists in food in our body in that way. Like we can have that variety and flexibility and in the end be in a place of health. Yeah. And two, I think the the research really shows that people who are intuitive eaters are healthier on most outcomes, you know, are, are in better health by various measures than people who are restricting themselves in some way, right? There's that Tilka study looking at flexible dietary control, quote unquote, versus intuitive eating. And you know, it showed that flexible dietary control is on a continuum with rigid dietary control, and you can't really be just flexible about your dietary control. You're going to slide all along that spectrum. So it's it's not sort of distinct, whereas intuitive eating is a distinct concept and way of relating to food. And the people who are intuitive eaters are actually in better condition, you know, physically than mm-hmm. the, and, and emotionally too, you know, and their well being and their relationship with their bodies is better than people who are rigid eaters. So that says to me that if we can truly break down the diet mentality, teach people to get back in touch with their bodies and use those cues and their satisfaction and pleasure in food to guide their choices, they're going to end up being balanced, having variety, eating in a way that supports health, and they're not going to have to worry about it versus the Mm -hmm. people who are always kind of like a top-down intellectual approach with it are not going to actually have as good of a health outcome either. Right. That's exactly what I was thinking. Cause I was, I'm like, why don't we hear more people talking about let's encourage embodiment. Like let's encourage you to trust what your body is saying. What is your fork run? What right now? <laughs> like, <that's, laughs> I don't know. If your fork could on. talk. <laughs> the oh yes. You can have a puppet show. Like, <laughs> but you know, like that, that's where health will be for that person. And there's so many different options, so many different paths. There's no like one exact answer. And yeah, like embodiment is such a beautiful thing. And I think it's how we were designed, you know, but the thing about it is if we all trusted our bodies and relied on them, there would be no point really for the diet industry, except for like disease management, like you said, like hypertension and stuff like that. But outside of that, there really would be no reason for it. Right. Well, and let's move that money to body positive yeah. businesses and stuff. Like we'll keep the money in the economy, but it's just like, let's funnel it to things that actually make our life better. But yeah, playing off your, I was sitting here thinking like, it is really starting. It's like concerning me, right? That why isn't every dietitian behind intuitive eating actually? I mean, it's been studied in over 30 some studies. Like how long does it have to be out and how long does it have to be studied? And to be shown that that intuitive eating is associated with better health. I mean, is, is it really a required part of curriculum? I doubt it. How does it even get in there? You know, it's almost like I've had people say to me kind of off, you know, like, well, I don't know if I believe in intuitive eating or I don't just 
people can't control themselves. I don't think it would work for them. And I just don't think they've done enough to explore it. Or they said, I don't believe in health at every size. I was like, have you even looked at what it is? Based on what you're telling me is probably not. Yeah. <laughs> right. yeah. <laughs> Which everyone needs to be where they are. But no, but, but, but truthfully, I mean, nutrition month is like our month, you know, and I'm proud to be a dietitian, but we have to start getting really serious about our biases as a profession mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and be open to looking at science that doesn't go along with what we've done our whole lives or what we've been taught in school because it's there. Yeah. Yes. And I can feel really icky and shameful, right? Like, cause I can remember really being into dieting and thinking that it was like the best thing and the way to help people. And it can feel really uncomfortable. And, but I think it's important, but you know, something that I'm really feeling hopeful about is I feel like even for the, my podcast, like there's so many dietitians in training who listen to it. And I think there's more people who are learning to become dietitians who are getting exposed to an intuitive eating just because of the internet. You know, we didn't have that in <laughs> school. We were just starting to have email. So, um, <laughs> so we sent um, smoke signals. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we, had a, we had the cup, cups with a string that we, would pop. but, uh, <laughs> but, but yeah, so I think like there's more exposure. So I, I'm trying to be hopeful in that, you know, there's more people that are aware of it, but yeah. I do find initially if someone rejects intuitive eating as a dietitian, that they're looking through it through the lens of how they're relating to food. And for, I mean, it's, it's not a secret, you know, I, there's research that like one in three nutrition students has some kind of disorder eating currently happening. And so I'm like, it's not one in three. Wow. So I feel like this is something that we have to also consider is like, what lens are they like looking through when they are learning about food? And we need to address that in order for dietitians to also help the rest of us. Absolutely. And can we just say that not dieting doesn't mean that you don't care about changing your habits or right. that not dieting doesn't mean you don't care about your health? Mm-hmm. Right. Like, why do so many? I just feel like that's the initial assumption. May, actually, I just realized it. It's because dieting is what we believe we do to get healthy, then therefore not (laughs) dieting. I'm literally just now realizing this because that gets me so frustrated. Like just because you Uh, say you're not dieting doesn't mean that you don't care about your energy and your well-being. It actually means you do. But I think that's why it's so hard for people. Yes, exactly. Like I have a cheesy saying I always say where it's like, it's not letting yourself go. It's letting yourself be. It's mm-hmm. like there's this dichotomy that people think if you're walking away from dieting, that, that means you're walking away from just any attempt at having a healthy long life. But it's not. It's just like, just let yourself chill. You know, like don't, you don't have to fight. Just put down all the battle gear and let's just be for a second. And that's where you reconnect to yourself. And I feel like that's where health resides, like physically and emotionally. Absolutely. Yeah, I think it's it's important to bring in the idea of size acceptance with that too, because I think a lot of dietitians, just like all health professionals and all humans basically in Western society, are sort of steeped in this idea that a thin body is a healthy body, right? This, the myth of the thin ideal and that that's supposed to be equated with health, which we know is not true. But I think that's something that you really have to question and dismantle for yourself in order to truly embrace the idea of health at every size. Because I think I see a lot of people who are like, I want to be on board with health at every size. And I think it's true to a point, but what about, you know, there's a certain size above which I just can't imagine that people would be healthy, you know? And it's like, that's, that's where they are. They're at. That's that person's limit in understanding health at every size. That's where their sizeism shows. Right. But it's mm-hmm. really true that yes, anybody at any size can be healthy, quote unquote, you know, in good health, if they're taking care of themselves in a self-compassionate way and not controlling and struggling against their body size or shape or its needs, you know, that Mm -hmm. people can actually take care of themselves in whatever body they have. And I think that that message, I know that when I went to school to become a dietitian, I certainly was like steeped in the rhetoric of the obesity epidemic, quote unquote. And part of why I went back to school was like, I'm going to work in nutrition policy and help battle obesity. That was like one of my primary motivations, which I feel very self-compassionate, but sad about now because I've learned so much since then. And also, why didn't I learn sooner? Why didn't I learn right when I went back to school? Like, no, actually, this is not what 
this is about. You know, the obesity epidemic is a myth. People's size doesn't dictate their health, right? But that's not something that really gets broken down in most people's nutrition education. So they can kind of go out into the world as dietitians and still have this sizest mentality that they're bringing with them. And it feels very natural at that point to be like, oh, well, you're in a larger body, just go on a diet. You have obesity, quote unquote, you have the disease of obesity. So we need to shrink your body. And it feels like that's the healthy thing to do. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There's so yeah. much fat phobia. They're just so scared. And mm-hmm. I feel like that if we could find a way for folks to not be so fearful of size diversity, then there wouldn't be this like compulsion to have to fix. And I feel like that's what the dieting is. Like it's the Mm -hmm. fixer. And if we didn't feel like we had to fix it, then maybe then it would be easier to change the game. Yeah. Yeah. I'll say, you know, a couple things that really helped me was one, having fat women in my family who I love deeply, no matter what, right? And then finding some awesome fearless, fat role models. Do you know what I'm saying? That's like, look at them, you know, Jessamine Stanley and all her influence with yoga and Jess Baker and her books. I want to know these people. I want to be friends with them. I want to, you know, like I want to learn and grow from them. We have to make room for everybody and every body and being more, having a desire to be more inclusive, I think made me more inclusive. You know, it helped me tackle biases. And even, I guess it was like, when I first heard everyone has a bias, I was like, oh, okay. So, you know, we don't have to <laughs> lock me in jail because I'm I'm facing that I have a bias, you know. We're all biased in some way and most are privileged in some way. You know, so to have this frame, to be able to acknowledge bias and acknowledge privilege, but still be curious and want to learn and grow, that really helped me a tremendous amount. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. You had to seek it out though, too. So that's the thing, like something in you allowed you to that permission to be like, oh, I wonder maybe this person is interesting. I don't know. Like there's something in you that led you to even like seek it out, which I feel like is what we need to encourage too. Like you said, connecting to people who are different sizes, because I feel like we can't make fat people to be the ones that have to like come to us because they're the ones being oppressed. Right. So Mm -hmm. like we really need to make sure that we listen. And I feel like that's for me, what helped me to really understand my privileges and being a smaller body was just listening to people who experience diets their whole life and how torturous it was. And I'm like, wow, that sounds just like my clients who I'm saying should stop their anorexia like type of behaviors. I'm like, (laughs) why is it okay for this person just because they're in a larger body? I feel like that's just listening in general has helped me so much to get to a place of appreciating size diversity and also really seeing it as a strength, especially in a, as, as dietitians. I feel like I love when I get to connect with dietitians who are in fat bodies. I'm like, yes, we need more people of like more diversity in every way. I feel like it'll just make us stronger. Absolutely. Yeah. I think that that kind of education and self-study really on seeking out the perspectives of people in larger bodies is so essential for dietitians. And I feel like it's just missing from our education. You know, it's something that we all stumble into. Like I said this on the podcast recently that I feel like we have all the information out there now. Health at every size research has been going on for years, you know, decades really. Same with the research on intuitive eating. We know we have a huge body of evidence that shows weight stigma is harmful to people, that size diversity exists, that there are people who are healthy all across the weight spectrum, that weight is not a predictor of health. And so why are we still teaching that in school? And why do people People have to independently come to this because all three of us have had that experience of getting out there in the field, doing the work as dietitians, making the connection like, wait, why am I treating this group of people differently than this group? And mm-hmm. they're having the same experiences and, you know, they're in different size bodies, but that that's the only difference kind of coming to it on our own like that. And then having to feel the tremendous guilt and sadness that comes with realizing we've done something that might harm a certain group of people when we've counseled people on weight loss or whatever in our past, like all of us pretty much Mm -hmm. who are dietitians have done that at one point or another. Mm -hmm. And like, why are we being forced to go through that when there is an alternative? There is evidence that we could be incorporating into our training from the get-go so that nobody gets out there and does this again. 
Well, the one I would add to your list of stats that you shared that I didn't hear was, I don't know if I get this exactly right, but basically that dieting is actually more likely to mess with your metabolism, right? Mm -hmm. In the long run and keep you away from your body's natural set point, wherever that's meant to be. I mean, some people are born high and stay high on their growth chart, you know, but dieting is actually more likely to set that off. So I think that is definitely worth the more we could see dieting as the enemy that it's not, you know, it is that bad boyfriend. It is that seductive lover that really wasn't honest with you, all those things you said mm-hmm. at the beginning. And that, that that is where you can garner strength for changing the game. And the other point I would add to that is, I'll speak for myself, or you guys can chime in. It's not like somebody comes in and I say, okay, no matter what, you're not allowed to lose any weight at all. Your body's not allowed (laughs) to change at all. It's like the only reason why I have a scale for blind weights is only because if they will bring me their scale and we'll just take it off the table. And it's Mm -hmm. like, if they'll let me, if they really need to know that I'm tracking it or whatever, it is literally a safety net for them. Otherwise, maybe if you're jumping out of an airplane or getting surgery and need your anesthetic figured out, there are not very many times where your weight is really needed to be known for your well-being. I think often, again, it goes back to the, okay, if I don't die, then I don't care. But it's like, I think that we're trying to just not it make it be about weight control. I I am definitely not saying, oh, do this and you will lose weight. That is messed up. Do not do that. That is more diet culture. We're wanting you to reach your better life and well-being through self-care that fits for you. So it's interesting in this, put your best fork forward. Maybe it's put your best fit forward. And what's the best, what's the best fit for you for well-being? And to me, that's what I'm helping people to do. To me, the weight is an irrelevant piece that I don't care. The only, the thing that I care about is how is your concerns about your weight impacting your self-care? Yeah, that's really well said. I agree. I'm like, I very much empathize with people's concerns about their weight in terms of how they feel, what they think that means about them, right? And the, the sort of baggage they have attached to it. But in and of itself, the number does not matter at all to me. I mean, I think it's, of course, people who embark on intuitive eating and a a self-care practice centered in health at every size. You know, some of those folks do lose weight as a part of the changed self-care practices. Some of those folks gain weight as a part of changed self-care practices because they were restricting and they needed to gain some weight to be at their biologically appropriate weight. Some people stay the same, you know, and you can never know for any individual what's going to happen to their body going into it. So I think that's maybe also a part of what's scary for people in changing the game. It's like they knew the rules of the old game, right? You do this and you're supposed to lose weight. And that's how you know it's quote unquote working with intuitive eating and health at every size focused self-care, you don't know what's going to happen to your weight. And unfortunately, that's a value that still so many people hold. You know, they think it means something about them. And in our society, they're told that and that message is reinforced over and over again. So it's very hard to kind of go into this great uncertain area, right? Just sort of giving up the rules of the game that you knew and just be like, who knows what's going to happen, right? Mm, yeah, it's not what we were expecting. But mm-hmm. I feel like that's what the one of the lies with it is that like our weight is meant to be controlled. And especially as a woman, I feel like our bodies are always changing. It's just like part of being a female. And, you know, since I, those are the parts I have, that's what I, I experience. I'm like, I'm for sure it's with men, they have their own kind of transitions and stuff. But I mean, I'm like, my body is changing. It's just what it's going to do. And it's not meant to be controlled and trying to control it is going to get in the way of like me staying as myself because I'm going to be then distracted and spending so much time on trying to like fight menopause and fight these changes. That to me is always such a sadness that I connect with when I think about how many women will fight their body as they're getting older when it's like, man, can't we finally just like be ourselves and like just like yeah. be in a place of like contentment You know, I thought that's what would happen after I left junior high and high school. (laughs) Like I would finally just be able to be myself. Yeah. Like it's just our bodies just are not, they're not designed to be controlled. They're supposed to just be. 
Yeah. Yeah. Letting go and letting, letting be is so important. But again, I think that comes back to the changing the game of like, if the end goal is fitting this ideal, this cultural ideal that's impossible and meeting these impossible standards that are impossible for everyone across the lifespan, pretty much, we have to just let that go so that we can really let our bodies be what they're meant to be and what they want to be. Well, isn't that a really interesting thing that as dietitians we could do, we could really educate the public on like, this is what you can expect as you get older. Not as like a doom and gloom, but like, this is just normal. Like this is normal physiology. This is how our bodies are going to change and everyone's different, but don't expect to be the same size that you were when you were 18. And it's not an accomplishment if you are like, it it just is. And it's okay to be more compassionate. It's okay Mm -hmm. to, it's okay to change. Like it's okay to change that voice in your head. And it's just like, to me, sometimes we have to stop and think about what does a better life for me look like? What do I really want? And I think that can help in the letting go process too, because it's almost, I don't know if this is the right analogy, but when I was working with my older daughter on jumping into the water, that very first time that she was like, we're just in the pool and she has her swimmies. I mean, beyond safe, I'm like a foot away. I'm like, come on, just jump in without like me pretending like she's jumping, like a real jump. And there was like such a hesitation and fear with that first one. And, and, you know, you could see her just like rocking and kind of getting ready for her fear, but it took forever. She finally did it. Of course, she was joyful and relieved and and full of positive emotion. And she got right back out. And then that second time, the hesitation factor was so much less. And it was actually through repeating it, she got her confidence, you know? And this is just an example of what it might be like. So yes, we're asking a lot to say, just let go. And that initial letting go might be that hesitation, but- that's how your mind is free to focus on something else. We're going to give you something else to focus on and it's going to require effort. But at the end of this is confidence, is joy, is just, I think, more satisfaction and a more meaningful life because I believe diet culture will change, but until it changes, we have to figure out a way to survive in it and then thrive in it if we're going to have a shot at our better life. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we can't just wait for it to change before we can be happy because that's going to be a while. <laughs> we have to work mm-hmm. at that, but we also have to figure out how to accept ourselves and the culture we live in now. And there are many people who've done it. I know we've all had our journeys and you've both been on the podcast in your individual episodes and shared those journeys of body acceptance. And I've had my own journey as well, of course. So we figured it out even in this toxic culture we live in. And I think it's certainly you have to have some resources inner and outer to be able to recover in this, Mm -hmm. in this environment. Right. So it's, it's definitely harder for some people than others, but it is possible for everyone. I think that's a very important note that it is possible. It's great to have a vision for where you want to go, but even where you think it's going to be today doesn't have to be where it ends up but you do need to start taking steps and every little step matters, you know? So just focus on the idea of change the game. We can all think of at least one way that an action we're taking is a rebellion, is a rejection of the game. And that matters and sharing it matters because you build community and connection and support. And we all need that. So we're less isolated and we're more engaged in something. And and that's going to take you to a different place. And then when you're in that new place, then you figure out what the next step is. Absolutely. Yeah. Taking just one little step can be such a huge game changer, you know, because it just leads to the next step and the next and the next. Well, yeah, it's like, Uh, Rebecca's daughter with the swimmies on, you know, like sometimes you can take the little (laughs) step and maybe you have swimmies or something on, but after that first step, yeah, like it'll be, it'll feel really hard, but then it'll start to get easier, especially because I feel like we can connect with others going through this same journey or these same kind of philosophy about size and, and food, you know, there's more of us now. So 
come on in our community. <laughs> you know, we're yes. always taking new members. <laughs> yeah. Well, so, I mean, I think that's a really good segue into action items, right? Like what can people do, people who are listening, do to become a part of this community and to learn more about changing the game and dismantling diet culture? Get a trash bag. And just put stuff in it (laughs) that if you think any of us, imagine we're with you. And if you think we would toss it, put it in the trash bag. I mean, I'm all for reduce, reuse, recycle. So great. But at least get it in a trash bag. So you have the visual of, I don't need this anymore. I love that. You know, you know what I love to do? (laughs) I love, I love to go to like used bookstores. I just, I just love them. And sometimes I'll buy a bunch of the diet books. (laughs) <laughs> because they're already great cheap. And I just go, I just put them in the recycle bin. Ooh. I mean, because I'm like, I don't want anyone else to have this one, like, especially like the really, really, really destructive ones. Mm-hmm. Like, oh. That's oh. a great, like, this- um, yeah, like <laughs> social, <laughs> like public service, you know? Yeah. Maybe, maybe art paper for my girls instead of buying construction paper. I'm going to tape together. <laughs> I get books with words on tape. Just paint all over this. Yeah. Nice. Well, see, my, my older one can read now, so I can't do that. Oh, okay. like, mm. <laughs> I'm <laughs> full, so that's a yeah. mess out of anything. Yeah. <laughs> or make confetti, or like, put it through a shredder, yeah. make some fun confetti. That's a great yeah. idea. You know, I thought about a book burning, but you know, the confetti probably be better as like environmental. Maybe environmentally. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Depending on where you spread it around, I guess, you exactly. know, keep it inside. Exactly. But I love yeah. that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I love the idea of sort of taking the tangible objects that are a relic of diet culture out of your life. And that can include like food items too, like diet foods or things that are that you would never eat when you had a normal relationship with food. Like I had never really eaten a rice cake in my life until I became disordered in my relationship with food. And since then, I j- just will not eat a rice cake. I just do not like them. So, you know, getting rid of those and not buying those anymore was a huge step for me. So thinking about things like that, that you can sort of confidently say like, this is a diet thing. I wouldn't like it for any other reason than it's safe, quote unquote, or it's allowed on my diet. So what about getting rid of that? Oh, getting rid of your scale for sure. Oh yes. Get rid of that one. There's an event in the South called Scale smash, I think is what it's called. Oh, yeah. Southern 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 Smash. Smash. Yeah, yeah. Southern Smash. (laughs) And those are great because people bring their 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 scales and they have these big sledgehammers and you just smash the hell out of it. So So awesome. Yeah. It's really, really great. And so cathartic and amazing to watch. And people have tears down in their cheeks, you know, and they're just smashing the scale. It's amazing because I really, I mean, that hunk of metal, we give it so much power. I'm like, and like we said, the science isn't even behind it anyway. So like it's like prehistoric. Get rid of it. Yeah. Totally. Oh my God. Prehistoric is such a good word for it. It's <laughs> <laughs> even those ones that seem so advanced that like talk to yeah. your phone or whatever. Like, no, oh, that's boy, no. ancient. <laughs> it's still a marketing ploy. How can yeah. I, you know, make them feel insecure? You know, watch this little TikTok dial, whatever it is. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And you can do, you can do much better by working with the person you are now getting in that head. So replacing, well, normally I would have done this and instead I'm going to journal. I think that's another good change the game type of activity. Start doing different things, things that you may have heard before that were helpful and just kind of blew off because like, no, there's no way that's going to work. Actually try them (laughs) and see. And even just because the age of social media and we're all sharing everything, it's like share more nuance of the context. So if you're going to share something that it just looks like a I don't know that typically you would look at it. Oh, here's another healthy kale salad or something like, can you share it and say, tell more of a story around it? You know, was there a certain ingredient that just jumped out on your tongue, you know, but like, so that it's not like, oh, good grade for choosing the greens, but there's more of a context of an understanding of how that connected. And, and the same thing, if we're bragging the fried Oreo or something, you know, like share more of the story and the context of how you are changing the game by, by enjoying your food choices or your exercise choices. If you're going to share those types of things, your story of what's in your mind is what I care to read about. And I think that helps you change the game. Now you're not 
Oh, let me fit in an Instagram, all the healthy things I do today. (laughs) You know, it's more about, let me connect with people who are following me and that and share more of how I'm doing today and what's going on and how I'm growing and how I'm, yeah, just learning and growing and and learning to be and what you're letting go of too. I would like Mm -hmm. to see more of that. I love the idea of thinking about your shares as a way to give more context. And also, I think a lot of the people who feel like they've built a brand around sharing pictures of healthy food or something, I think it's super important for those folks to recognize that it's actually detrimental in many cases to share only healthy food pics, right? Like you want to share uh-huh. pictures of things that are not the smoothie bowl and the kale salad and the colorful, beautiful produce. Because what if someone who's really vulnerable is looking at that and is like, I really admire this person and they're eating only plants and I don't <laughs> see any, I don't see any protein or fat or carbohydrate anywhere in the picture. So I guess that's what I should do, you know, which is mm-hmm. sadly the case. I mean, I think when we share, we have to sort of think about who our potential audience is and how they could take things, you know? So that's, I mean, that's part of the reason on this podcast, I like bleep out numbers. I really make an effort not to tell any details about my own history or other, you know, let other people tell their own details that could be used as a how-to manual of how to have an eating disorder or change your body or whatever, because it's just not, you just never know the place someone's going to be at when they're listening Mm -hmm. to something and how they could be triggered. Right. Yeah, that's a good point. And, you know, an action tip I would give too is really seeking out size diversity like we were talking about mm-hmm. earlier. And um, I know for me, you know, I'm, I live in the same world where the thin ideal is considered beautiful. And and when I came to this place where like, okay, I know intellectually that this is not what I want to believe anymore, but yet it's still the tape in my head. I found myself seeking out people in larger bodies who were expressing themselves and and feeling beautiful in that expression. And especially on Instagram, I found that after a year or so, I'm like, wow, I can tell it is shifting my perspective of what is beautiful. And I know that sounds kind of vain, but I feel like it also is... Um, wonderful. I'm like, Mm -hmm. I can just tell it's changing. And so there are many people that I encourage to do that because I feel like if we can open up the, the window of like, what is acceptable, you know, then we can accept whatever outcome our body's going to have in any space and time, because it's not as scary, you know, whatever those outcomes could be, because wow, any person's body can be beautiful and acceptable and deserves compassion, you know, all those things. So that's one thing that I would, I would encourage too. Yeah. Changing the game, I think, means changing your eyes in some ways, mm-hmm. right? Changing your vision of what mm-hmm. is beautiful. Because again, in diet culture, we're sold this vision of beauty that looks one way and is unattainable. And that sets the standard, quote unquote, for what we're supposed to find attractive, but actually really blinds us to the, the actual diversity that exists in the world. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I love that idea of you know consciously following people in larger bodies posting images of themselves and themselves in different contexts and situations. I think that's so valuable and important. Well, I think that's a great list of things people can do to start changing the game in their own lives. And we'd love to hear from everyone listening what they're doing to change the game. So we've actually created a hashtag, just hashtag change the game that you can share any of your rejecting the diet mentality, game changing efforts this week or anytime you want. So definitely tweet at us and tag us and hashtag things change the game. And then where can people find you, Julie, online if they want to learn more about your work and what you're doing to change the game? So you can find me on my website. It's juliedillonrd.com. And you can also find me on the Love Food Podcast. Yes, such a great one. And I will link to your episode of Food Psych as well, because you were you had an episode that was lovely earlier this or last year now, actually. So I will link to that too. All right. And then Rebecca, tell us about you and where people can find you online. Sure. So go to bodykindnessbook.com. There's some great kind of, there's a get started section. And when you click on that, there's a free digital training that you could take. It's a five health rules to break. And that comes with a self-reflection guide 
And at least for a limited time, you're going to get a free chapter of the book, Mm. which is nice. Yes. And as well as one of my client's favorite tools, which is my health and happiness journal. So it's a way to mindfully observe and track things that where there's no room for how many grams of carbs was in this. (laughs) It's just general things that are important to track about mind, body, mood that my clients have just helped me refine and, and love. So all that is, is just free for you to get started. And certainly the book is available wherever books are sold and eBooks. And I appreciate any purchases. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'll put the link in the show notes for people to get it directly from this episode. So everybody should go out and order that now. ASAP. So thank you so much. Really a pleasure talking with you. Thank you for having me. So that's our show. Thanks again so much to our guests for being here and to you guys for listening. And we'll be back again next week with another brand new episode. Meanwhile, I'd love to stay in touch. And the best way to do that is via email. So you can go to christyharrison.com slash email to sign up for my VIP list. I'll send you info about new episodes of the podcast as they drop, as well as exclusive sneak previews of new episodes, giveaways and other special deals on the products and services I offer, special tips on how to make peace with food and learn to trust your body and a whole lot more. Sign up at christyharrison.com slash email. You can also subscribe via iTunes and leave us a nice rating and review, which is a great way to get the word out about the podcast and help other people find these important messages. Just go to iTunes from your computer or your podcast app, type in food psych to the search bar, click on the result that comes up under podcasts, and then click on ratings and reviews, and you can leave a rating and review right there. And I really appreciate all the five-star reviews and wonderful ratings that we've gotten because it's helped us climb really high right now in the rankings. And that's really cool because we're competing against some of the weight management and body shaming types of messages that I'm trying to fight with this podcast. So we've really started to beat out a lot of the diety voices, and I'd love to continue climbing higher in the rankings to get this message out even further. So please leave us a nice rating and review. It's so very much appreciated. And thanks to everyone who's left reviews so far. The music you're hearing behind me now is by a band called AWOL, and the track is called Food, used under the Creative Commons license. Thanks so much for listening, and until next time, stay psyched. Stupid or scared, no work in the kitchen now. Who put you there in that perfect position now? Bullies want your food, and you ain't really beat. Have you ever went over your friend's house?